Varsity Blues is the college admissions scandal involving roughly 50 defendants, 32 of whom have pleaded guilty, including the ringleader Rick Singer, who helped affluent parents fake everything from sports accomplishments to test scores in order to guarantee their admission to the university of their choice. There are a few holdouts, though, maintaining their innocence. And at least one of those holdouts, specifically John Wilson, a former CEO, wants to make sure that nobody on the jury hates rich people. And so this has become one of the key questions to the jury. Are you biased against wealthy people? Is this a question that usually comes up when you're screening a jury, the the socioeconomic situation of the defendant? No. And uh, this is a unique situation that the defense is taking that approach. And interestingly enough, each court, meaning the judge in that court, has their own sets of rules regarding questions for the jury and how much the lawyers are allowed to question in the process where they select the jury. So there are judges who actually don't allow any of these kinds of questions. Um, They'll allow the attorneys to submit questions, but the judge uh, themselves will actually ask the the jury's questions. It's it's different by court and the rules are, are really undefined there. So it's just really up to the judge. But the question generally comes down to, is there a probative value in the question that will help determine that a juror, whether or not a juror is biased against the defendant? Um, And so that's what they're doing in this case. They're asking to see, are you biased against wealthy people? But the judge has the right to say, "Hmm, that's a ridiculous question. And it's not, it doesn't get to the heart of the matter. And you know, often our system wants to assume that jurors will be fair in the way they approach trials. And actually the evidence over the decades is generally speaking, things like the economic status of somebody has a tendency not to be as influential on the jury as we might want to think it is. also being very, very careful about the jury having been exposed to any information about this case in the news, the documentary that came out recently on Netflix. How realistic is this anymore in today's world to expect juries to not know anything about what's going on? The, the key here is whether or not the jury is walking in prejudged on the guilt or the innocence of the defendant. Obviously, the defense wants them to think that they're innocent. And obviously the prosecutor would love that they think that they're guilty, but the goal is that they haven't prejudged. It's really hard in today's world to be completely isolated from the news. However, you know, I would suggest that, that many, many people are not as well informed about the news as we might think they are. So they maybe have read a headline, but they haven't actually read the detail of what is going on. And again, it goes back to uh, the judge wants to make sure that the jury is not uh, biased or prejudged in, in one manner or another, generally speaking. If this question will help them get to the bottom of whether or not a jury is going to walk in and fairly assess the evidence as presented, that's what they're trying to get at. I, it, some of these questions are a little odd, though. I mean... You know, (laughs) let's read it. I mean, right out of right out of the questions uh, requested by the defendants. This case has been referred to by the media as Varsity Blues or the college admissions case. Have you read any articles or books, watched any news, read any information in websites or news feeds on the Internet or viewed other media coverage such as a documentary related to this case? Yes or no? If yes, please list any books you have read or television shows or documentaries you have watched. If yes, describe the amount of media coverage you have seen about this case. 
none, a little, a moderate amount, a lot. So that seems like innocuous questions, but that is really probing deeply. And this is almost exclusively up to the discretion of the judge. Now, if the defendants uh, don't agree with the judge says, this is, this is too much, they can try to appeal it. But the appeals courts give great deference to uh, trial court judges on this type of discretion. So this is really going to come down to what the U.S. District Court judge in this matter has to say about this. And by the way, the judge is Nathaniel M. Gorton, and so far seems to be a real kind of straight shooter. Again, 32 of the roughly 50 of these defendants pled guilty. Many have been sentenced. And then you have this group, this small number, who are insisting that they are innocent. They're pleading not guilty. Do they really think that they are going to be found not guilty when so many of their counterparts have not only been, have have pled guilty and admitted to the charges. Doesn't it even just look bad that they're pleading not guilty? Well, you're not, a a jury is not supposed to consider the fact that they pleaded not guilty because the, the presumption in a criminal trial is that you're innocent until you're proven beyond a reasonable doubt that they're guilty. If the presumption is you're innocent until proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and by the way, that's thinking to yourself that it's like 95% certain that the evidence on all of the elements of the crime that you're being accused of, 95% sure that the evidence proves it on each end of individual element. So no, I, I think that, the, you know, look, if you have enough money and you want to fight this and you think like, for example, I believe one of the defendants is, is saying, no, my kid really was a water polo player. And not fake and really did want to play water polo in college. And so this is not a fake thing. Maybe it's worth fighting it all the way. And again, if you have the money to pay for that defense, you know, go for it. The defendant's team want to make sure that the jurors have not seen for example, the Netflix documentary, but all the Netflix documentary is are conversations that were wiretapped by the FBI. But I mean, isn't that going to come out in the trial anyway? Yes. The prosecutors will absolutely use the recordings in trial. And and it's fascinating because nobody has argued that those recordings are fake. Therefore, the authenticity has not been challenged. And the only question would be that if the defense says evidence shouldn't be admitted, it's prejudicial to the jury and it lacks probative value, which I think there's not a judge that would grant them that. And the prosecutors absolutely want wiretap information. That that information is powerful and how it influences a jury because it's in the words of the defendants, you know, on tape not in a court situation. And so that is really, really powerful. I think that those recordings are very damning for the defense. That is a steep, steep hill to climb when you have the person's own words admitting what they did. But again, you know, we're talking about things like fraud again here, which requires intent. Did they know what they were doing was to deceive somebody else? And based on what Netflix has presented, it sure seems that way. Rick Singer, who has pled guilty and was early on an informant working with the FBI, is possibly going to testify, but we don't know. Do you think he'll testify? Well, that one's really interesting, and it's really ticking off the defense in this case. They're wanting to know, why have they not announced? So you have to, when you go to trial, you have to submit to the court. 
a list of exhibits of witnesses, what the topic is, uh, you know, how it relates to what's happening in the trial and the court has to approve these things. And there are lots of, there's lots of action behind the scenes that people might not know about where the attorneys are fighting back and forth about the admissibility of evidence. And this is a very interesting one because Rick Singer is the star witness and the assistant U.S. attorney running this case in Massachusetts, Stephen Frank, has said that the prosecution team has not yet made a decision on any witnesses, and they're planning on giving the defense a two-day heads up on who they plan to bring to the stand is naturally upsetting to the defense. Now, why wouldn't you bring Mr. Singer in to testify? Well, if I have recordings on tape, that are not being challenged for their authenticity, I can use that as the evidence to prove the elements of the crime. I don't need the witness to come in and confirm what was happening around it. If anything, I think it might be dangerous to bring Mr. Singer in to testify because what the defense would try and do is hammer him, hammer him on how this is how you get into elite universities, that there's this whole corrupt system behind the scenes and so look my client simply trying to play the game that was already there and that mr singer and others are saying look you want to get your kid into a these top schools this is how you have to play the game the prosecution might not want to bring mr singer in because now that can plant seeds of doubt in the jury's mind and so this is really a fascinating little game of chicken that is going on here between the prosecutors, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the defense teams because, you know, the prosecutor is going to play it all the way up to the last very second before they say, yeah, Mr. Singer is or is not going to testify. And the defense has argued with the judge in this matter that, look, you can't do that because if you bring Mr. Singer in, that's going to extend the trial. We're going to spend two weeks cross-examining him, which, by the way, is a tip-off to the prosecutors here that that's what I'm suggesting is very likely the case. They're going to attack Mr. Singer on the idea that this is the way you get your kid into these top universities, is this super corrupt system. Therefore, my client was merely doing what was necessary and was told to them as necessary by Mr. Singer to get their kids in these college. I, I think this is actually maybe the most interesting part of the case that is not well talked about is whether or not Rick Singer testifies and what that will mean to the defense's case if he does and their opportunity to exploit the system and plant those seeds of doubt. I, I, I just, I can't wait to see what's gonna happen with that. Is socioeconomic status something that could be used in the future as a defense? I think that's possible. It's a harder argument. And just as a society as a whole, I don't know that that is a winning argument very often. It really depends on the jury itself and how that shakes out. So that is so dependent on the jurisdiction and what the jury pools look like in the jurisdiction where you're trying that. You know, if it, it and I don't want to suggest which area of the country, or which jurisdiction is going to be better or worse for that. But there definitely are going to be certain jury pools that will be more sympathetic to a lower economic status defendant. The biggest problem that you're going to run into with a lower economic status defendant, just generally speaking, while there are amazing public defenders in this country, often in most parts of the country they are underfunded they are understaffed they are overworked and they might not have the uh, resources to fight the feds as much as these wealthy defendants have and subsequently you know what the data show us is that more often the lower socioeconomic status defendants are going to just settle for the plea deal 
And, and that is actually a big question of justice in our country is just because I'm lower socioeconomic status means I have to accept a crummy plea deal. Whereas these super wealthy individuals don't take the plea deal and they're going to fight this thing tooth and nail and maybe come out better because of it. Yeah, it feels like a multi-tier justice system when viewed through that lens. Thank you for listening to Law Junkie Show. Find us on social media at Law Junkie Show on Instagram and Twitter. Be sure to rate, review, subscribe, like, and share. We love your feedback. Contact us at info at lawjunkieshow.com or go to lawjunkieshow.com and fill out our contact form. Disclaimer, Law Junkie Show, including its guests and hosts, are not giving out legal advice, but discussing general legal issues. Law Junkie Show does not guarantee that the legal issues discussed are fully accurate, and it's not specific to whatever legal issues you may be experiencing. None of this advice is to be acted upon in your situation. Please seek legal advice from a licensed attorney in your jurisdiction for your individual legal matter.